The agenda this week heard the case against billionaires from writer Anand Girdardas and spoke to former Senator Hugh Siegel about his battle to combat poverty in Canada. The agenda's week in review begins asking whether the Internet's early promise is paying off. So we were talking about how young the Internet was back in January of 1996 in this very studio. And uh, Sheldon, shall we roll a clip and see if anybody recognizes anybody in this clip? Fire away. I think the web represents an explosion truly from the grassroots that none of us quite anticipated happening so quickly, that just exploded from everywhere. This is the thing you hear about it, is that this thing is, is you know, anarchic, mm -hmm. unregulated, totally democratic. Unregulatable. Unregulatable. It's uh, technologically infeasible to do something as basic as determine how many computers are connected to the internet. Uh, in a situation like that, it becomes very difficult to block access from or to a specific A government's computer. nightmare then, right? Uh, it can't control it. Yeah, if you want to take that sort of, if if, if in in if this were if this were a movie starring Sl Sylvester Stallone, the internet would be the means by which the underground threw off the yoke of their oppressors. <laughs> you know, it it it, it 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 is in some senses uh, an anarchic environment in which it is very difficult to keep track of who does what and when and how. Well, the first person we heard from in that clip was Bill Washburn of Meckler Media, but I think the other guy sure looked a lot like what Cory Doctorow might have looked like when he was about 12 years old. Um, Corey, how much do you agree with your former self? You know, I would, I would, uh, in the spirit of, uh, the creative arts here, I would give my, my former self a yes and, <laughs> and that and would be that in addition to being the means by which people organize movements for liberation, it's also the means by which those they organize against create the counter-revolution. Um, and, and I think... I'd like to think that back then I was cognizant of that too. I mean, people don't get worked up about the future of the internet if they think it's just going to automatically be great. So uh, I, I think that there were many of us who were both excited about the possible future, but also terrified about how it could go wrong. Right. Prescient for 24 years ago, I'd say. Ramona, how about uh, some of the adjectives we heard? Anarchic, democratic, and unregulatable. I mean, what do you say? certainly watching it, it feels like my how times change and how we learn and hindsight is 2020. Mm -hmm. You think about those early days and everyone sort of scrambling to get uh, the domains as if it was, um, you know, as if it was actual real estate and they were the ones who were hoping to get rich and not all of them did get rich in the end. But even just sort of looking back at this now, there's this idea of, you know, you talk about the, the yes and and the creative mind, uh, that the creatives move into the, the new neighborhood, the derelict neighborhood, and then everyone follows who wants to make a buck. And I think that that's what we've seen with the internet is there was that sort of hopeful, um, uh, that hopeful utopian vision of what it could be. And of course, once something becomes hot, once it's been made uh, a space that everyone else wants to clamor to, those who, who want to cash in on it will, and, uh, and the rest follows as we've seen. Well, Jacob, in which case, how naive do you think the creators of the internet were back in the day? Well, it's a great question. For me, I think a lot of this has sort of almost religious undertones. You know, when you hear people talking, the passion with which they're talking, that it's a new movement, that there's anarchy, that there's opportunity, that there's freedom for everybody. Um, and now I, I think what you're seeing is that there's been so much money just dumped into the system. It's become like an accelerant. And you know, the thing that comes to mind to me is like the Catholic Church and when the Catholic Church just became kind of like Fat Elvis and the whole thing started to lose touch with its roots. And now we have essentially a Protestant movement saying we need to return back to these principles on which the Internet was founded and what it was kind of meant to be, because what we see right now bears no real relation to those founding principles. And that's a danger for the internet going forward because it needs those principles to work well. We're we're um, at a crossroads now where the internet has become kind of the nervous system of the 21st century. And our problem with regulating it is that, you know, there are people who come at it and say, well, how do we make sure that it's safe as an entertainment medium? And others who say, how do we make safe that it make sure that it's safe as a public square? And and we have to make it safe for all the things that we're doing with it. It's it's where we find romance and education and employment and all the other elements of our lives. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't regulate it, 
but it means that we should regulate with gravitas and care and not say, well, so long as people aren't watching TV the wrong way on the internet, job, our job is done, even if that makes it hard to do, say, civic engagement. Uh, we have to do all of the things. On November 5th, J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon said she uses some pretty harsh words. You know, some would say vilify successful people. I don't like vilifying anybody. I think we should applaud successful people. Okay, let's pull this apart a little bit here. The, what, the Warren Wealth Tax. What do you think, for starters? A couple things. First of all, when I Jamie Dimon contacted me to challenge some of my public comments on these kinds of issues, and he had no problem vilifying hardworking people when I suggested to him that a lot of workers are exploited in America by the CEOs that he admires and pals around with, and he said, no, some people just don't like to work. So he has no problem vilifying punching down. He just has apparently a problem with people vilifying billionaires. You know, if you think that a 3% tax only on those assets you have above a billion is vilification, you need to get out more. <laughs> you may be living in such a cosseted, cotton ball bubble that you actually don't even know what it means to be, to have anybody tell you the truth. 3% is a lower percent than all these people make in their annual returns on capital, okay? She's literally not even gonna, I actually disagree with her plan in that sense. You want it higher. I actually don't think anybody's fortune would get smaller because now she's raised it to six because of her Medicare for all plan, so that could, but even six, most of these people have a rate of return on capital that is in, in excess, so you know, it's in the tens or teens in many cases. And so the idea that a person who is proposing to merely reduce the rate at which you continue to get richer than other people is vilifying you, you gotta get out more. Um, you know, what's really interesting, this is the, the couple talking points that we're seeing emerging under what I call kind of the great plute freak out of 2019. All these people, you cited some of them. I mean, I would cite Michael Bloomberg is now exploring running for president out of the same motivation, right? Leon Cooperman just went on CNBC and cried. Michael Bloomberg is maybe the first person in history to run for president as a form of tax evasion, right? Just to literally avoid this, this nominee who might tax you 3%. Um, and what is so interesting is you're seeing the talking point. So talking point number one is the one, is the one you cited. You're vilifying, you're demonizing, class warfare, that whole talking point, mm. right? When in fact, you know, Warren actually gets attacked on the left for not going after these people hard enough, for saying she's a capitalist, for saying she believes in capitalism. Yep. Um, second, the talking point is, hey, this is not bad for us. We're, we're not about us. This is bad for you. If you tax us billionaires more, you guys are gonna get hurt. And here's why. So Zuckerberg says, there's gonna be no diversity in medical research because all these rich people are funding different medical research things. Mm -hmm. Apparently the kind of diversity Mark Zuckerberg believes in is in medical research. So there's gonna be none of that. Uh, Leon Cooperman says, all these good works, all this money that I'm gonna spend on charity, won't be able to do yeah, that. They give to the arts and et cetera. Right. So this is what's called, I would call economic concern trolling. Where in, you're in, instead of just saying the truth, which is, hey, I, I kinda wanna keep my money, they make up this whole elaborate thing of if you tax us more, it's gonna be bad for you. Even though we now know, and this is remarkable, if you look at the Warren plan, you will get some of Bernie Sanders' plans, by taxing like 100,000 people, which is a really small number of people in a country of 350 million people, you could fund programs that would transform the lives of every American citizen. Wipe out student debt, fund universal free college at public universities, universal daycare. I mean, like, there's no person in America who wouldn't have their life altered, including affluent people and very poor people and everybody in between by these plans. The idea that you can do that entirely, multiple things like that, and now actually added to it Medicare for All under Warren's plan, just by taxing 100,000 people tells you how much money those 100,000 people have under their mattresses, right? You, I, my guess would be in this country, you couldn't do that much social spending just from taxing the top 100,000 people. Maybe you could, but my guess is that you don't have that level of concentration. Mm -hmm. Which the fact mistake. that you could do it mm -hmm. is evidence of the problem. Well, the Panama Papers was a big deal a few years ago. At least it was a big deal in the placement it got in the media for a few days. And it certainly 
reflected on all of the wealth that is being sheltered in tax havens offshore. It was a big moment in investigative journalism, and it looked like it was going to lead to something, and it ended up leading to nothing. And I'm wondering why. You know, I, th I mean, I think it goes back to your Occupy thing. I don't think any of these things on their own leads to something. I think this is a cumulative effect. I think the Panama, Panama Papers are baked into why you and I are having this conversation. The way Occupy is part of why you and I are having this conversation and why the 2008 financial crisis is part of why you and I are having this conversation. To me, what has slowly happened in an accretive way is that various stories have like needles started to kind of prick the balloons of a belief system that said entrepreneurs are heroes, government is bad, government is bad. Now again, this may not really resonate in Canada as much, but in the United States, we really have been on the receiving end of this 40 year ideological war. 35% of, um, of our seniors were living in poverty. And I remember when that report came to cabinet and I figured for sure uh, there'd be the normal right-left split and nothing would happen. And uh, to Darcy's everlasting credit, the position uh, he took was that these are the women who, um, who stood by when our, when our men and women went to war. These are the women who went through the, went through the, um, through the depression and they're not going to live in poverty in my Ontario. And that produced the Guaranteed Annual Income Supplement Program, supported by all three parties, which basically said, you don't have to fill out any forms, you don't have to go see the welfare department. If your income falls beneath a certain level, you'll be topped up automatically. It's a guaranteed annual income. Yeah, it was called the Guaranteed Annual Income System Gains, and, um, and it shows that we know how to do this when we want to. Hmm. And that was, that was a very instructive moment, certainly for me, on this issue. Mr. McHugh is uh, still around and will be 87 next month. Indeed. You moved back to federal politics. You eventually became chief of staff to Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. But in the course of that, he let you chair a task force looking into the guaranteed annual income idea. What emerged from that? The reason that it happened was because we did away with the universal family allowance. And I was one of those who thought that we'd never get away with that. But we replaced it with a much more enriched child tax credit, so low-income families did better than, than was the case because the money was being spent in a more effective way. We, um, I had, the task force was myself, uh, Ian Green, who was the Deputy Minister of Health, and a bunch of other public servants, and we rode in perfect circles uh, for about four months because the people from Treasury Board and Finance did everything they could to keep any progress from emerging which is one of the problems with the whole idea of the basic income. Every finance department in the world is made up of people who are against programs that automatically discharge cash to help people in a circumstance. Why? Because they would give up their discretion. Their discretion to advise on how much you spend and how much you don't spend is limited every time there's an automatic program, like OHIP, um, uh, like the Guaranteed Annual Income Supplement for Seniors, now called the GIS. It's a federal program now. So they are opposed to any of those kinds of measures, and that, that produces one of the points of resistance in terms of making the change. I want to take you to the 1990s now, and I want to ask you something. First of all, let's take this. Children, you want to put this picture up? This is 1998, and here is Hugh Siegel running for the leadership of the now-defunct Progressive Conservative Party of Canada. That is a contest you might have won had Joe Clark not decided to jump in uh, late in the race and try to reclaim his old job, which he did. I w uh, let me say this. You, you've had a tremendous impact on Canada, but you've never managed to get elected. And here's my smart-ass right. question. Right. How, um, how, much of it is, how much of a sore point is it for you that in spite of all of the contributions you have made, you've never won an election? So I don't view it that way, and maybe just to sustain my own sanity. Um, I view it this way. I've had the chance to be involved at the electoral level and to run for office, twice for parliament and once for the leadership of my party. I don't think I was treated unfairly in the process. I think the competitive process is what it is. Um, I was beaten by people who had more standing or more background or more reputation, and that's how politics works. So I'm not bitter about that, although I must say um, I remember 
when Aaron O'Toole was elected as a federal MP, when he was one of the young people who had worked in my leadership campaign, along with, uh, uh, with, with others, including Patrick Brown, and et cetera, and when he was being sworn in, uh, he was kind enough to ask, I was then in the Senate, Senator Siegel to pin the parliamentary uh, House of Commons pin into his lapel, which I was glad to do. And, and I said at the time, why is it um, better in terms of getting elected uh, to know Hugh Siegel than to be Hugh Siegel? <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and all the people from my campaign who were ministers of the Crown and MPs and whatever, enjoyed that and so did I but I'm not I'm not bitter about that at all I'm I'm delighted to have had the chance and I'm glad to serve in other ways and that's just some of what we covered this week on the agenda for more including the full conversations you can visit our website that's tvo.org our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda or our Twitter feed that's twitter.com slash the agenda The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.